Well, thank you for the introduction and, and thank you for being here today. It's uh, um, really a, a pleasure to be here. It's always lovely to come to southern Denmark and see Sunni and others. Um, and, um, and I'm always uh, reminded when I think of that title, I initially think it's such a great title, and then I think it's such a daft title, right? Making Creative Divisible, because we could see it everywhere, right? You can, you know, Sunni was telling me that he loves David Bowie, and he listens to David Bowie, you can hear the creativity, you read your favorite author, you can see it, of course. You know, you go to a museum, there's artwork, that's great, of course you see it. So creativity is certainly visible. Yes, sorry, yes. Um, what I'd like to talk about, though, is the process by which a product that was ultimately be deemed creative comes about. So the processes out of which then a product is, um, is, is considered creative. At least I'll try to do that with you today. Um, on the menu, um, this is a summary of some of the things I'll do. I'll start with a joke, and you'll humor me hopefully for a few minutes, a crude one from the Crudes, the movie. Um, here, there'll be a crude I'll stop in a second. Model of insight of how new ideas come about. Um, and it's pretty funny, so uh, um, until you realize that that crude model, in fact, has informed and has driven a lot of research in psychology. Now the joke is no longer funny because you're thinking you can't be serious. That can't really be your model of how creativity comes about. Uh, we'll move on to, uh, we'll explore the, the neuro, very neurocentric perspective of creativity and, and banking um, a lot of our bets on a creative genius and how far that takes us in understanding creativity. We'll discuss as well how creativity is operationalized by psychologists in the laboratory. So, you know, what, how do you go about quantifying someone's creativity in terms of the, their ability to generate creative ideas? Um, then we'll uh, compare and contrast two models of um, ideation and how ideas travel, a diffusion model on the one hand and a translation model on the other hand. And the translation model, in fact, which I think is a much more productive uh, way of thinking about how a, an idea takes form, how it's communicated, and in the process of taking form, of being materially, materially reified, is changed and changes as well the originator and changes the interlocutors in an interesting, slightly unpredictable, contingent snowballing process where there's essentially the idea becomes polymorphic, it evolves, it mutates, and so forth. Then there'll be an opportunity for me to very briefly mention Nick Chater's book, The Mind is Flat. Mine certainly is. And then also an opportunity, to, of course, to plug my favorite author, Margaret Atwood. Um, and then we're going to shift to um, um, a more cognitive ethnographic uh, perspective on creative ideation, especially the origin of new ideas. And here I'll, I'll employ an old technique that psychologists have used, that is to say, looking at how people, and by that I mean bored, usually white undergraduates in British universities, how they go about solving insight problems. And why insight problems, in fact, are quite, an, I would argue, quite an interesting tool if you employ them properly. And if you instrumentalize your procedure in such a manner that you could follow in quite detailed, granular way how the idea is constructed. So I'll, like to, I'll show you a few case studies just to, and, um, and then I'll conclude with how you go about unflattening the mind I confirm with Sunni that my made-up word unflattenessing was not a rude word in Danish, um, so I think I'm okay. And if there's time, although I'm told I've got 45 minutes, if there's time, then I'd love to tell you about Paul March, a, uh, a sculptor who's also very interested in making creativity visible. Uh, right, okay, you and me, a few minutes on, on the crude model. Um, let me set it up for you. The Crudes is a movie, some of you might have seen it. Usually my cultural references fall completely flat with undergraduates, although possibly Crudes, they might have seen it. Or, you know, if I mention, if I dare mention, say, Stanley Kubrick to them, they go, is that a footballer? You know, like they don't, anyway. But um, in this particular scene in the movie, which I'm not gonna show you, but anyway, uh, Krug, the main character, the voice actor is Nicolas Cage, incidentally, um, is being separated from his family. There's an enormous uh, chiasm, an enormous ravine that he must cross, but he can't. He needs some kind of flying instrument to help him bridge to jump over that. Um, and, but he's a caveman, yeah? So he doesn't have very good ideas. Um, but this is how he goes about getting an idea of how to cross that chiasm. So these are screenshots. These are stills from the picture. This is Krug. So how do you go about having ideas? Well, you've got to squeeze your head, obviously. That's what he does. So he squeezes his head. And then there's, he engages in a bit of 
transcranial direct current stimulation. He tries to knock his head. And eventually, he experiences a caveman orgiastic eureka moment. You know, the enormous phenomenological marker of a great age. So he's got a great, now he's figured it out, how he's going to cross that chiasm. How does he do it? So his idea is, in fact, quite original and creative. It's also quite complicated. Uh, first, he needs to find a flying vessel. So he finds a carcass, a big rib cage somewhere. Somehow, he also befriends a mechanivore. I don't quite understand, because earlier in the, mo the movie, the mechanivore, all it wanted to do was chase him and his family and eat them. But somehow, at this stage, they're buddies. So you'll need the mechanivore, in fact, well, there's a reason why he needs them. Anyway, so he's got the big rib cage. So the idea involves um, uh, pasting the rib cage with some kind of gooey, sticky substance. So he finds some tar. So he, he uh, smears the rib cage with that. Then he alerts the piranachetes. Now, the piranachetes are these nasty carnivorous piranha parakeets that fly in hordes. So he jumps on the mechanivore, uh, attracts their attention. Then he, he runs with the mechanivore, runs into the rib cage. And then the piranachetes, the hordes of them, fly towards the rib cage. They get glued on it. They try to fly up. And of course, the whole thing lifts up. We achieve lift off. Some I also, I forget how he gets fire out of this, but he has a torch at one point. And he's able to steer the vessel by going outside the rib cage. And when he puts the flame on one side, the piranachetes go like this. And put the flame on the other side, the piranachetes go like this. So he manages somehow to cross a chiasm and then be reunited with his family. So that's great. That's uh, incidentally, in this model, let's think about this very crude model of ideation. So where do ideas come from? Well, surprise, surprise, they come from your head. Uh, you just gotta, you, know, you gotta, you gotta, I don't know, exercise that brain muscle. And if that doesn't work, then you stimulate it and you, <clears throat> you know, you hit your head or, in fact, later on, we'll talk a bit about transcranial direct current stimulation. Um, and on the one hand, but also, this crude model is very much a diffusion model. That is to say, he has an idea. And once the idea made contact with reality, well, who won? The idea, right? So the, re the reality yielded completely. You know, you've heard the expression, no plan survives contact with reality, but not Krug's plan. Yeah? Yeah? So he's got the ribcage, the piranachi, the tar, the fire, the, all of that worked beautifully. Yeah. OK, so that's our crude model. Now the, so that's kind of funny, sort of. Um, um, but um, and it's very much a model as well that's taken grasp of or yeah, grip of uh, a lot of um, researchers in uh, creativity and, and creative cognition. And there's good reason, of course, to think that, yeah, it, it'd be very important and cool to understand why sometimes there's these amazing insights in the world. You know, you think of Darwin reading Malthus in September 1838, and he's, he thought, oh, yeah, super fecundity with limited resources, selection ideas. I mean, what an idea that is. Of course, it's a phenomenal idea. So hence, you can understand the interest in looking at people and their brains, specific, you know, what is it about that person? Of course, that makes sense. Um, then a lot of the, so given this and given our crude model of creative ideation, the work also proceeds on the basis of this juicy tautology. Creative people have creative ideas. Now, as tautologies goes, of course, they're not very productive because we don't want to start, you know, we can't start our explanation of creativity with a creativity substrate, right? Somehow, creativity has got to emerge out of something that's not creative. But for now, we'll take that tautology as some kind of, I don't know, some kind of, has some kind of heuristic value. And we'll try to then identify the degree to which creative people have creative ideas. Fine. Um, a very influential paper published now 60 years ago by Mednick um, suggested that one of the reasons why the Darwins of this world have such creative insights is because their, their memory is sort of structured differently. Um, and their association hierarchies are flatter. So they're more likely to connect disparate ideas, um, whereas someone who's less creative is more likely to come up with a few stereotypical or prototypical ideas. So when they're asked to, in Mednick, this is hypothetical data, incidentally, when Mednick says, imagine the word table, um, the more creative person, the frequency with which a more creative person will generate associates, um, that, that frequency curve, as it was, will be flatter, whereas someone who's less creative will have a steeper association hierarchy. So they'll come up with a few very uh, prototypical um, associations and afterwards will run out of ideas as it was. Um, so, okay, um, so he tells us 
So look for the creative people and I'll bet that their association hierarchies are going to be different. Fine. Now, it's a little harder, of course, to look for creative people. Um, you, know, you, you know, find a group of Darwins, right? Now, what you rely on is, again, your university undergraduates. Now, how would university undergraduates, how creative can they be? So, I mean, really, I mean, no, I'm being filmed as well. I've got to be careful. No, they can be very creative, for sure. Um, so how, how, do you go, how do you go about doing so? Well, you need to somehow operationalize creativity. How do psychologists do this? Well, they've got lots of psychometric instruments uh, to separate people, to identify them and put them in different categories. Now, we've got to say this with as much respect as we can muster. So in this particular um, study by Benedict et al., they used the Ronco's ideation behavior scale, the RIBS, lovely acronym. It's a self-report measure. It's 18 or 23 items. And uh, so it's a Likert scale. So people say, you read a statement such as, I have, this is true, I have many wild ideas on a scale from one to five. One doesn't describe me at all. Five, it's completely me. And so students say, complete the scale, and then you get a score. Yeah? And then the median split it. So those above the median, they're the high creative. And those above, now you could say, well, yeah, yeah. If you do it right, maybe you could take the top third, maybe, and the bottom third, possibly, something like this. But essentially, this is how you operationalize what's considered to be a creative person. There are different ways of doing so, and I don't have enough time to, you know, there's, 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 an, there's an array, there's a repertoire. Both self-reported measures, as well as, as uh, creative behavioral um, uh, questionnaires. Um, anyhow, so when you look at the association hierarchies of so-called high creative and low creative, what do you find? Nothing. Hey, don't work. Okay, so, right. All right, let's explore uh, maybe a different way. Let's get rid of, let's not so much focus on identifying what kind of ideas creative people have. Um, let's now shift to how you go about operationalizing uh, a creative ideas. And psychology is very fond of two ways of doing so. One is a measure of convergent thinking, the other is a measure of divergent thinking. So I mentioned Mendick earlier. Mendick is the originator of the rat the remote associate test, test. So you're given three words. In this instance, the words are apple, house, and uh, family. And you need to think of a fourth one that's somehow associated or connected. Yeah? And so someone's uh, creativity is gauged in terms of, say, in a bank of 30 of such rats. Um, how many do they solve? And how quickly do they solve them? OK, that's one measure. Um, the other measure that's very commonly used is uh, originated from J.P. Guilford's very famous address to the American uh, uh, Association, Psychological Association in 1950-something. It says, you want to measure divergent thinking, you, use, you employ something that's called the, either the alternative uses test or the unusual uses test. Uh, you're given a common everyday object. It said, right, in three minutes, tell me how many they may have different uses of that object. So if you're given a cup, then you think, well, maybe I could use it for my toothbrushes, maybe as a stand for my phone, and so forth. So how do you then gauge creativity? Well, there's a different ways you can do so. One, you can measure fluency, that is to say the number of distinct ideas that are generated. So you literally count them. In this instance, there are four, I guess. You can also measure the, the originality. That's a bit harder to measure the originality. There's different ways of doing so. You can do it on the basis of some kind of consensual assessment technique where you get a panel of judges that look at everybody's answers and rate them. And you can rate that way. Or can you do it from a, a statistical infrequency perspective? A very infrequent answer is given a high score of originality. A very frequent answer is given a low score of originality. All right, so good. So we've operationalized what creative cognition is in terms of a measure of convergent and a measure of divergent thinking. All right, before I'm going to show you the next slide, let me say a little bit about the brain. And I'll pretend I know what I'm talking about. Um, the, uh, the prefrontal cortex, very important part of the brain, a very important part of the brain for decision-making, conscious inferences, working memory, and so forth. The argument is it's very Im implicated, it's very important uh, in the generation of ideas, but it plays two roles. One, both in its ability to uh, generate ideas, so the conscious um, conjuring of ideas, as well as its ability to select and inhibit the bad ones. So it plays both roles, right? So it's sort of a, a, a grassroots, uh, bottom-up, let's generate a lot of ideas, um, as well as a more uh, executive, selective uh, process of monitoring the kinds of things you generate. There's also an argument that maybe the, the controlled executive function is more a function of the left 
uh, prefrontal cortex rather than the right. Uh, maybe the right prefrontal cortex also has a different form of association hierarchies. Yeah, so you, you could just imagine the huge neuroscience literature about these two things. Okay, so here's the context for the next experiment. Uh, here's, this is transcranial direct occurrence stimulation. Um, this is a Lee et al. paper. There's three different montages that are used. So this is a silly thing for me to turn around, but that's good. So L minus R plus means that the, um, the left prefrontal cortex is inhibited. Uh, R plus means that it's um, excited. Um, or L plus means the prefrontal, left prefrontal is ex excited, R minus is inhibited, and so And of course, it's a control sham condition. And they're looking at people's performance on the unusual or the alternate user's task in this panel, um, and the, the rats, the remote associate. So in terms of mean fluency, so how many different ideas were generated and mean originality on the secondary axis, remote associate test, the mean reaction time to solutions, latency to solution, and the mean accuracy out of 15. <coughs> and what do we see here? Nothing. <laughs> There's nothing in those data. Um, so, well, I could say, well, the way you've operationalized the thing, yeah, of course we can have a debate. Maybe these are not good measures of creativity and so forth. And maybe, maybe this whole thing about transcranial direct current stimulation, you know, who knows? I, yeah. But um, in fact, the whole paper is also predicated on very w sort of, is it wishy-washy? It's very ambiguous uh, data from previous studies as well. I think they were really keen to, you know, we're going to really sort this out and we're going to have these... <coughs> These, uh, these, these double stimulations, one excitatory, the other inhibitory, and we'll see what happens, in fact. So there's a sense that, um, you know, based on that very crude model of ideation, based on a diffusion model of idea propagation, uh, based on either hunting for creatives or operationalizing create, uh, creative cognition in terms of those measures, there's a sense that this is a degenerative research program. You know, we're not, this has been going on for 60, 70 years, and we're not... You know, there's, there's no light here at the end of the tunnel. Um, that's a great book by Nick Chater. Nick Chater is a, uh, is a psychologist working at the, the Warwick Business School. And, um, um, and um, he argues fundamentally that you know, online, off the cuff, in our everyday interactions, the kind of, the kind of thoughts we have are rather pedestrian. <laughs> you know? Uh, how we, you know, how we, not when we sit back and reason and write an essay over a month or something, that's different possibly, but certainly the, the quick inferences that we draw, uh, our choice preferences in the moment reflect relatively shallow processing. So the mind is rather flat. Um, and um, this is a Yale University Press published in 2018. And yet on the back of the book you read, wow, the mind may be flat, but this book has got some depth. It's well-rounded. There's a substantiality to the book. So here's a little uh, paradox, right? So you got a flat mind, but then you can do great things. You know, how does that work? Um, now, writers are confronted with flat minds all the time. Um, this is a screenshot from a documentary on Arte in France on Margaret Atwood. And, and she describes um, the early phases of writing as downhill skiing. Right? So she just puts everything down on paper. So this isn't a notebook. And so she writes, and a lot of it is terrible. It's crap, right? And it's struck off, and there's speech bubbles, there's plans and stuff. But that's a start. Right? She starts that way. So yeah, the mind is flat, certainly. She doesn't know. But there's an interesting bit of sort of snowballing, scaffolding process right? that's initiated by that initial phase of, of um, r random gibberish. It's not quite gibberish, but yeah. Is Patricia Hempel, who is a, um, a memoirist and essayist, who says, and I'm going to read because I love to read that quote, but um, I'll try to read it with feelings as well. Um, it still comes as a shock to realize that I don't write about what I know. I write to find out what I know. I love that. Um, is it possible to convey to a reader the enormous degree of blankness, confusion, hunch, and uncertainty lurking in the art of writing? When I am the reader, not the writer, I too fall into the lovely illusion that the words before me, which read so inevitably, must have been written exactly as they appear. But here I sit before a yellow legal pad, and the long page of the preceding two paragraphs is a jumble of crossed out lines, false starts, confused order, a mess. The mess of my mind trying to find out what it wants to say. This is a writer's frantic, grabby mind, not the poised mind of a reader ready to be edified or entertained. So, 
So there's a process here, isn't there? So we're moving away from initial ideation, you know, this, this, this ideation ground zero, this point of origin story. It's not this po the point of origin is not so important here. We don't really care about the point of origin. We care about how it's transformed, how it's translated, right? So that's the process that really interests us. And so in my work, sir, and I'm trying to move away from banking on this initial point of origin, this ideation ground zero, and focus on how it's built, the scaffolding um, that takes place once that silly hunch is put down on paper. I am, sh look, I don't want to speak for you, of course. And maybe you write beautifully worded sentences as soon as you sit down. But I certainly don't. Uh, I completely relate to what Hempel says here. Um, um, uh, distinction between diffusion and, and translation, I, I mentioned it uh, briefly, briefly. This is uh, taken, well, I suspect that idea has been around for a while, but it's really nicely articulated in Bruno Latour's Science in Action book, published now some time ago, nearly 40 years ago. And the diffusion model is a bit like Krug's idea. So Krug had an idea about how to fly over the ravine, yeah? And that idea survives contact with reality. So, um, and the diffusion model is also a model that, and I'll illustrate it in a second, you know, that where you, you're trying to coronate, celebrate the originator of an idea. And of course, for various reasons, sometimes it's quite important uh, to claim authorship of the idea, of course, you know, through patents and so forth. And art is clearly, and if we have time to talk about Paul March, you'll say, well, you know, I, my art is from a system of creation. Of course, I've got to put my name next to it because I want to be paid for it, or I want to, you know, I want to go to a museum. People, I want people to read about my life or whatever. But really, I'm only one actant as part of a system of creation. So there's a diffusion model of ideas and a translation one. A translation one is, I think, what is much more interesting. Um, so Margaret Atwood jots down these hunches. Patricia Hempel does as well as you do possibly. You start a process. Um, writing that sentence, writing that first paragraph, well, changes the world, by the way. You've populated the world with a new object, your paragraph, or you've drawn a sketch, or you build a maquette. So there's a nice bit of ontology here. Right? There's a new object in the world that you've created. In the process of doing so, the idea you had that motivated the initial construction will be changed because there'll be feedback. The objects will you know, be an interesting sort of dialogic process that goes on. So you populate the world with something new that changes the world, changes you, and then there's a lovely dance of sorts that takes place that ratchets up the process such that then you end up with something that is, that is beyond the flat mind, right? All right, so um, diffusion, um, so the diesel engine, yeah, uh, well, uh, 20 years after diesel put the patent out for the engine, there was a huge controversy because fundamentally, sure, uh, the engines that were eventually manufactured, that were eventually reliable, yes, did not use power plugs, yes, they used compression of air, just as diesel kind of envisaged in the uh, in 1890s, but really the engine that it was eventually manufactured had very little to do with the patent. And so to understand innovation in this instance, it's kind of weird to cor coronate diesel as the originator of that because then there's 20 years of engineering tinkering um, that made this engine possible. Alexander Fleming, if you go to St. Mary's Hospital in London, you'll see the plaque. I'm sure you heard the story. Um, he came back from holiday in um, uh, September um, 1928. He had forgotten to uh, clean a few petri dishes. Um, he realized that uh, some of them had molded, and in some of them, uh, the bacteria that he was studying was dead, a sort of bacteriophage. He goes, huh. Oh. And apparently, he said, that's funny. Yeah. And so the plaque says, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin in the second room, whatever here. Except that he didn't. He couldn't make it work. You know? He tried to replicate the experiment, didn't work. And others before him, including Lister of Listerine fame, I'd used the same mold, I'd made the same observation. And it's many years after, primarily during the Second World War and primarily in the United States, that penicillin as we know it, right, was really created and manufactured and distributed. Um, let's dance. So I got my David Bowie fan. I didn't know I'd have that. I guess, no, I guess none of my, not all my cultural references go uh, wasted. But um, so that's the best-selling although you'd argue probably not the best album, but it's the best-selling album of David Bowie. And Let's Dance, the single, is also um, the, uh, the most successful single in David Bowie's career. Um, but 
We can have a debate on this. He didn't really write it, even though he gets the credit for it. Right? Let's Dance has an interesting story behind it. And let's listen to the producer tell that story. And the producer is uh, Nal Rogers. Bob Clearmountain was the engineer at the power station in New York when they recorded that thing. And uh, it's, uh, there's lots of different things. That story, by the way, is, is triangulated, but different accounts. David Bowie tells that story. Not only the meeting, the trip to uh, Switzerland. There's also, on YouTube, you can also listen to the first demo they recorded in early December uh, 1982, which sounds different from the finished song as well. So there's each, each of these stages is an object. So it's when he changes the chord and this and that. It just, there's a lovely progression of how the idea gets translated 
and eventually in the recording studio. Then he also there. Um, anyhow, uh, that's part of the story. What else did I want to say about this? Anyway, uh, let me, I realize I've got 15 minutes or less, actually. So, and I'd like to do, what's that, sorry? 15 is fine. 15 is fine, okay. So I'd like to do a bit more psychology and, and do a bit more um, um, uh, cognitive ethnography, as I promised earlier. Um, uh, inside problem solving. So we're going to go back to the lab, and we're going to look at an interesting tool that psychologists have developed, and they, that's an inside problem. What's an inside problem? Um, an inside problem is designed to confuse, <laughs> is designed to lure a seductive interpretation that is incorrect. Essentially, it's designed to create an impasse, a feeling of, don't know what to do. Yeah. And then the psychologist is poised, the researcher is poised to observe how the insight, or I should say the impasse is overcome, and an insight is experienced. So essentially what we're looking at here, we like to capture, we like to mobilize the worldly phenomenon of new, creating a new idea. You want to capture, you want to domesticate in the lab by using an inside problem. So I'll show you two, two examples of inside problem solving, and I'll show you two examples of that kind of granular ethnographic approach that I take to then trace, to make the process of generating a new idea uh, visible. This is a triangle, a coin problem. That's a very classic inside problem. Uh, ten coins are arrayed in a triangular shape that points down. Um, the goal is to transform this, transform this shape into a triangle that points up. Duh. That's very fine. It's easy. Sure, but there's a nasty constraint. You can only do so by moving three coins. Ah, okay. So there's two things you need to discover here. Two new ideas you need to discover. One is which three coins and where do they go? Yeah? Um, now, we've instrumentalized the procedure. So by the way, we've labeled the coins so we can trace their movement. We've also overlaid the problem on a nine by nine grid, numbered rows, letter columns. We bring, oh, by the way, I should say, initially what participants do, and most of them do that, very few incidentally solve this problem under a minute or with very few moves. So some of them, they're generally given 10 minutes to work on this. About 70% will end up solving it, but they have to work. <laughs> and they work. Uh, are creative undergraduates, as I mentioned them before. Um, uh, what they tend to do initially is, well, you want to change the triangle, you want that to point up, then they migrate the coins up, and they go, hey, there you go. Except here you've moved six coins, by the way, so that's an incorrect solution. So, uh, um, we, this is pre-COVID, we bring it into the lab, at least that work was conducted pre-COVID, overhead cameras, the, um, the, we use a, an interface and in distance sensor, although we've used different material uh, when we looked at this problem, so participants touch and drag the coins on that screen. They can also reset the screen when things get too confusing. What I'd like to show you is, um, uh, <laughs> I'd like to be the midwife <laughs> uh, to a new idea, um, uh, two new ideas in this instance. So this is a case study. This is an actual participant, um, and I've schematized uh, the video coding um, by showing you how the triangle the configuration of the coins looked over 58 trials. Believe me, it'll take 10 seconds. I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up. But what's interesting to look at here is the participant is manipulating an object. And I, I'd like to think that there is that kind of mutuality, sort of object thought mutuality. There's a very close coupling between making the object do something then reacting to it. The feedback that it provides you and then that anchor and authorize the next action. So the action affordance, and I'm looking at Ed possibly, the action affordance, the topography of po action possibility is dynamic and is dictated by the shape of the object as it's manipulated. What you observe, so incidentally, this was two things. The contour of the shape is drawn here, but that's just for you. It's really not drawn when participants actually do this, as well as the corner coins are in dark black. That's not like this for participants. The, co the coins are not color-coded that way. The co corner coins are color-coded this way because these are the coins you need to move. So just to help you trace their shape. So what does, whoops, what does a participant do? Uh, well, they do that, and they move them up. So the shape what is a reset. Um, so there's an attempt in many trials where it's simply move, migrating the coins north. Now, what's frustrating for that participant is that that object is not a good one. <laughs> It ain't working. It's not helping you see things differently. But there's that kind of slightly silly 
be, uh, fly that buzzes against the window trying to get out when it just goes six centimeters on the side and it could escape. And it's just, you know, uh, recursively reconstruct the same shape over and over in a way that's not very um, productive at all. Now, there'll be an interesting move. So we see this repeatedly. This is trial 33, 34. Um, now, here's this one. Now, what's happened here? Um, the previous one, the, uh, that coin was there. The T coin is moved there. That's the first time the base is widened. You think, aha, they're onto something here. So instead of migrating the coins north, they've got to lower the base. That's the key of solving. You go, aha, they've got it. But they don't, actually. Mind you, they reset the board here, and then they go, okay, let's widen the thing again. They widen it again. Right? It's this, grope, this myopic groping in the dark. But the object now is more interesting for them. And they're going to use that widening base, and now they start moving the corner coins, and they widen the base with the corner coins first. But look at how difficult it is, how um, painful. Oh, not there yet. <laughs> Oh, not there yet. Reset, and finally, they will solve the problem. So here, here, if you go at the, if you really expand the granularity, then you can see how does the new idea originate? Well, um, with difficulty, <laughs> very slowly. Also, by making an object do something. So there's this, this, this codependency. There's a, there's a dual process of becoming. The object eventually embodies a normative configuration that corresponds to the solution. And you have internalized what the correct solution is. You have understood the problem. But that, that evolution is a co-evolution. It's a process of co-determination. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so in terms of the construction of a new idea, in this instance, from the perspective of instoring a new idea is through uh, making an object do something. So you, you know, there's a physical interaction. Um, you could see what the world throws back at you. That perspective as well um, uh, problematizes, uh, in a very interesting manner, notions of causality and intentionality and agency. Right. So who is responsible for finding the solution to this problem? You can't say you can't say it's the coins. You know, who is responsible for the sculpture? You can't say it's the chisel or the hammer, it's the, it's the sculptor. But at the same time, it's not so straightforward, is it? Because the object also triggers or encourages certain actions. So somehow it bears some of the responsibility as well. And constructions can be evaluated. You know, some of the, uh, some of the coin configurations were not very mm, felicitous. They're not, they were not very good. Um, but other constructions are much more encouraging. And, and, and lead to much better selections. Here's another example. This is matchstick um, arithmetic. Um, um, and um, in a matchstick arithmetic problem, you've got a false uh, arithmetic expression in A. Um, you use Roman numerals. And the goal is to transform this false expression into a true one by moving, not removing, by moving one matchstick and moving it somewhere else. So it can either be in B, you can solve it this way by um, changing, you take this horizontal bit here and you create uh, an equal sign here. So you go 3 minus 2 equals 1. Um, or alternatively, you take one stick from here and you would move it there and then you make it true. Um, when, it was, when that work was done initially, um, and it's been cited thousands of times, that paper, um, um, it's co completely static. That is to say, participants are shown the false arithmetic expression. They stare at a, at a computer monitor. In fact, there's, a ver there's an eye-tracking version of it where they have a, they have to, there's a bite bar in their mouth, and they can't move. They can't touch anything. Right? It's completely immobilized. And just by looking at it, they're trying to restructure their idea. So here, you know, um, uh, the ideation is completely mental. Um, and yet you would think, how much more interesting would it be to turn it into a dynamic thing such that, again, this is an interesting physical object that could be manipulated that could also give you a lot of information. Um, I'm going to show you a case study. This is a pilot case study. The, the participant is given this problem. Again, the procedure is operationalized where the problem is overlaid onto some kind of grid that will facilitate the coding subsequently. The problem is 1 equals 2 plus 2. Um, this is, um, this is during, and the work was done during COVID, so we do it uh, remotely. What we do, 
is uh, we put the, um, <clears throat> the experimental procedure on a set of PowerPoint slides, which we s email the participants once they've agreed to, you know, time and the Zoom call starts. They upload the slides, then they share their screen. They don't run the slides in slideshow mode, but rather in edit mode, where they can manipulate the things. Um, so here's, um, hopefully that'll work. This is a maths tutor, by the way. Eh? This, this lady, uh, the pilot participant, she knows, she um, teaches maths in high school. So it's not that, that numeracy is not the issue in this instance, right? There's no maths phobia or anything. I think it's, I, I, so I thought it was a lovely bit of interactive problem solving where she manipulates the object. What's particularly interesting as well in this one um, is I'll see if we, if you, oops, sorry, I don't wanna do it again. Uh, if you look at, so I've got the verbal protocol, right? And, uh, and you can time when she says certain things. Um, and it's really the movement when she starts decomposing the plus sign, right? So the ooh-ah is at 1630, but she started decomposing the plus sign at 16, at 16 whatever, 11. So a few, you know, a second and a half or so before. And she moves it, and then there's all that ah-ooh business. <laughs> ah-ooh, ah, okay. So really the object is quite interesting here. And you know she hasn't solved it by doing that. There's no inside just yet, because what she'll first do is move it there. And she goes, one equals, and she goes, oh, it, that doesn't work, obviously. And then she uses this lovely movement metaphor. Um, there we go. Then you move it there, and you solve it. So there's this very tight coupling between thought and object here. It's very dynamic. It's a process of becoming. As the world trans is changed, you changed with it. I think this is a manner, this kind of detailed granular ethnographic approach is a way of capturing um, a process of, of creativity. Let me finish then um, by um, talking about unflattenessing, going back to Nick Shader. So basic flatness, the basic human mind, uh, that comes free of charge. <laughs> uh, we're all born with that, I guess. Um, so you're looking in, in the process of articulating something, so you're looking for traction in the material world, but inevitably, um, you know, you express it, either you write it down, you sketch it, you verbally communicate it. So then, it's, then it has a life of its own as it was. It starts, it starts evolving and mutating in different ways. Certainly the perspective is uh, temporal, it's temporally defined, it's developmental, 
it's gradual, it's contingent, it's recursive, to be sure. What's interesting about these objects um, is that quickly the object is smarter than you at the starting point. So, you know, you've polished an essay, you know, you, you know, you've got five pages and you're pretty satisfied with them. The five pages that you've written are smarter than you were when you started writing it. So the object embodies uh, an interesting developmental um, evolution on your part. Um, so, and I was talking about this double movement, and that's also a key concept in a lot of Bruno Latour's writing, the double movement of the uh, originator, as it was, and its contribution to the world. So as, the, as the, the, the creative agent populates the world with new things, clearly the world has changed, but you are changed by the very process of doing so in a nice sort of <clears throat> spiral of human becoming. I would argue that clearly creativity is in the product. Uh, and to understand creativity, you cannot start with a process that is deemed creative. So there's nothing creative, certainly, in the undergraduates in my lab solving either the triangle or coin or uh, the matchstick arithmetic. But nonetheless, they do come up with new ideas. Um, and um, you make creativity visible, I would argue, by uh, tracing the assembling process. So by in monitoring quite, in quite a detailed fashion the material installation of the object in different phases of creation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fred. We have 10 minutes for questions, comments. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, first, I just wanted to give you a, a reference. You may know it, but uh, a German author by the name of Heinrich von Kleist in 1810 wrote a short text called On the Gradual, Gradual Production of Thought Whilst Speaking. And it kind of encapsulates the move that you're trying to describe here, moving from having the idea inside the head onto, uh, in this case, the production of speech. Uh, so he goes through all sorts of uh, famous people giving speech, Mirabeau, for example, giving a speech, who had no clue what he said at the beginning of the sentence, and then gradually develops his idea as he's producing, as he's speaking. So thus, the, the gradual production of thought while, while speaking. I, I, it might be useful Absolutely. to you. Absolutely, um, thank you, yes. Um, but but I, I had another question. Um, I mean, today, creativity seems to be one of these concepts that are inherently positive. Um, <laughs> if, if, if you look at sort of the, the intellectual history of genius, you find the same ideas, uh, and of course that's intimately connected to, uh, to the notion of, of creativity. But there's a kind of darker side mm -hmm. along, uh, that sort of runs along the, the positive evaluation of, of genius, uh, and one of my favorite concepts is, um, is a concept that uh, Kant uh, develops. He, calls, he talks about original nonsense. And we have to be very wary of original nonsense. So the, the genius for, for Kant is the person who breaks a rule, but thus establishes a new rule. But you can also break a rule and not establish a new rule because the creative idea isn't powerful enough. It's simply original nonsense. Sure. So, so I, I'm curious sort of what, what psychology, whether this sort of features on, 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 on in, in psychological research, this sort of distinction between ideas that really are creative, but they also have a lasting value, and then creative ideas that truly are creative, but in essence, they have very little value. Yeah, and it's a, thank you for the question, by the way, and thank you for the reference. That's really helpful. Um, and so there's, so, uh, there's two bits to the question. So there's a fair bit of work in the past 15 years on uh, malevolent creativity. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> there's a, I don't know, um, I know what the date, because I, I was caught in the security line checkup at, uh, in, in New York that time. There was a guy who tried to blow up a plane by putting gunpowder in his underpants. And I just got, got a bad burn, but I don't think that worked so well. But nonetheless, that day, um, coming back uh, to England over the holidays, you know, you had to put your hands in your trousers, and then they had to put chemicals on your things, see whether you had gunpowder in your underpants as a result of that. So that's kind of, you know, that's kind of creative, isn't it? I mean, it didn't work, but um, so there's a fair bit of work on that, malevolent creativity is, and for example, um, there's a interesting work on coercive control and malevolent creativity, the ways in which people gaslight, manipulate others 
by creating situations. So that's, that's important work as well. And you're right, generally there's that kind of benevolent uh, aura to creativity and creativity, but certainly um, and the research is expanded in different uh, directions. The whole thing about value, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, it's a tough one in part because, and some, I think, above Weisberg who thinks that value should not be a good criteria because he thinks, I forget the name exactly, but there's a very, very celebrated 19th century painter uh, who was enormously uh, famous, was commissioned to do this and that, is, is value from an art history perspective now is considered you know, very little, whereas you know, Van Gogh had no value, but posthumously somehow, he's, you know, once you're dead, you're more creative than when you were alive. So, but nonetheless, um, for creativity to have traction, yeah, that value must be realized by a number of interlocutors and an audience as well, and that value itself then I think is a, an interesting construction. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. That was an excellent talk. Um, so may maybe I, I don't know. I'll just try this anyway. So, so, so what you've described here seems like a rather linear process in my, in, in my mm -hmm. mind. And, and going back to the beginning, mm -hmm. where, where does this idea that the penny drops fit? You know, back to Darwin's reading of Mars, for example, or something like that. I mean, how, how does that fit into this? I, I think there's a place where it's certainly, and you're right. Yeah, and we've, we've also experienced, I mean, I've downplayed it, but we also experienced it ourselves. Either there are, um, you know, tiny insights or very big insights about, you know, little problems that bugged you or very big problems that have bugged you. You're right, sometimes there is a moment the penny drops. And there's, I guess there's also, it deserves that kind of scrutiny as well. It's very difficult, though, to erect a science of creativity on these moments, in part because it's difficult to domesticate these moments under laboratory conditions, for example. Um, if you have... One, some, like, I didn't have time, but I did prepare a few slides. Not that I want to show them now, but um, you know, I follow an artist, a sculptor, who does v very large sculptural installation. And, um, and, but you realize there's a lot of micro uh, penny drops <laughs> along the way. And then, then it becomes difficult to say, oh, that particular penny drop, in fact, you know, uh, is the cause of the finished product. Rather, is there concatenation over time? Um, so I think, I think, I think there's, there's an authenticity to that phenomenology of, ah, I see. And that's an interesting phenomenon. And indeed, I think it deserves, um, it deserves attention. Um, I, incidentally, not to say that what I observe in my lab must be particularly important, but I very rarely um, observe the, this pure insight, a pure insight sequence of being nearly catatonic in your impasse state. You go, don't know, to like, bah, I get it. Now, but sometimes it's captured, you know. Um, uh, Bob, I mentioned Bob Weisberg in a, in a very ambitious paper about 10 years ago, large data set, about 7% of the problem solving sequence could be described in terms of that pure insight sequence. So, so it's a great point. I, of course, I de-emphasize de it in part because I wanted to do my, my granular cognitive ethnography uh, to show that in fact, you know, the, 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 the creative, what's creative is the product and, and uh, the, uh, the intermediate phase is uh, possibly less creative, but nonetheless, that is definitely a genuine phenomenon. Other questions? Oh, you could coordinate better next time. Just before lunch, that's good. So uh, nowadays there is more and more talk about artificial intelligence becoming creative, and uh, we seen some huge leaps, for example, in the game of Go. And um, so I was wondering to, to what extent do you think that artificial intelligence can be genuinely creative according to your framework? How does it creativity f for humans uh, within your framework would, would compare to creativity? <laughs> uh, such a great question, yeah. Um, well, uh, certainly in terms of sort of sheer muscular data crunching, uh, you know, that's clear, you know, I was hearing a few days ago about uh, how AI can contribute to the development of new uh, medical treatments, for example, or, or new medicines and whatnot, sort of grinding through, you know, enormous databases and so forth. Um, well, I guess that's creative in some sense. I'm not sure whether it's a definitional, definitional thing that you're asking about. I think, yeah, possibly. It's too, I guess, what's a little, is it too bad? It's a little opaque, though. So the degree of opacity, you know, how does machine learning eventuate in, you know, settling on, you know, the and this particular conclusion? Um, you got to do a lot of matrix algebra, I guess, just to understand how the machine operates and so forth. So from a from a process perspective, I guess it's slightly less interesting for me, 
you know, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as an apprentice cognitive ethnographer, how it happened. So there was a second part of your question that was about AI. Uh, so, so I would I say yes, yes, um, yeah, um, yeah, animals can be created too. Finally, we have a question from uh, our live stream. Mustafa Kasim says, thank you uh, for the talk. And he says, you mentioned the effect of transcreational stimulation. What is about psychedelic effect on creativity? What about the? A psychedelic effect of, on creativity. Um, um, yeah, I think Nile Rogers was high. I, but he says so as well when he did Let's Dance. I mean, really high. Um, and at one point he crashed, so uh, I don't, I'm sorry to say, so this is facetious, well it's not that facetious, it's, it's a fact. Uh, certainly, um, yeah, drugs work <laughs> sometimes, um, but I don't know much about the research, you know, the sustained research, for example, of how, you know, you know other psychotropics or different types of, of drugs would uh, influence. There's, there's a fair bit of work, for example, on psychopathologies and, and how medications may also interact with creativity. Um, but again, I suspect the evidence is also rather muted on that front. Um, if you talk to art working artists, working painters, and so forth, they usually clean. Mind you, they can smoke up from time to time, and, but they show up to the atelier, they show up to the, and they work. They work eight, 10 hours a day, just like a dedicated researchers, and that really defines their work. Whether they're, um, you know, can they be drunk? And I know J.G. Ballard, you know, the guy who wrote uh, Empire of the Sun and so forth and Crash, you know, would start drinking scotch after he dropped off his children at school. He would drink till three o'clock, <laughs> utterly hammered, go get the kids at school and then sober up in the evening to make their tea and so forth. Um, and that's, a, well, that would be a, a work, a functioning alcoholic in this instance. Sorry, that's not a good answer to your question. Thank you so much, Fred. No, you're welcome. Talk. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.